Masai Mara National Reserve, Kenya. As many as 10,000 migrating wildebeest mysteriously drown in the Mara River. In Arkansas, 5,000 blackbirds suddenly drop dead in mid-flight. Something's going on. Some people said there'd be days like these. Is hell enlarging itself and that without measure? Are mass animal deaths happening with horrific frequency? King Island, Tasmania. 200 pilot whales beach themselves. Are these mass deaths normal? It felt like a mystery. Or is something new and unexplained going on? Deadliest animal apocalypse. New Year's Eve, 2010. While fireworks light up the sky all over the world. In Beebe, Arkansas, a grim rain of blackbirds falls from the sky. People around the country are still talking about what's going on in Arkansas. Birds falling out of the sky, hundreds of them. What makes that happen for them just to drop out of the sky like that? Just kind of freaked everybody out. Millions, millions every night. You look over the sky, it's just black. So, and then uh, last night at about 10.30, I come out here and uh, seen a bird drop. I didn't think nothing of it, and I woke up this morning at 7.30 to see blackbirds everywhere. And if that isn't bad enough, just a few counties away, what is happening? It sounds like a scene from a sci-fi thriller. Thousands of dead fish wash up. Experts estimate somewhere between 80 and 100,000 fish die. Something's going on. Is hell enlarging itself and that without measure? Well, that's one theory. Turns out dead blackbirds have been seen in this area before. They have a history of trashing crops and infuriated farmers have fought back. But 5,000 dead birds is not the work of angry farmers with firearms. So what could possibly have happened? Wildlife pathologists examined the birds for signs of illness. And everything checks out, except for one thing multiple hemorrhages, bleeding. Lab tests show blunt force trauma to the bird's vital organs. Blunt force trauma, the kind you get when you fly full speed directly into things like trees and buildings and each other. So how could this happen? Fireworks are something to consider, but there have been fireworks before. This year, something in the weather conditions may have made everything different. Something mysterious going on above the birds between 7,000 and 12,000 feet. An inversion layer, where cool air gets trapped below warm air. According to scientists, the freak temperature inversion created a colossal megaphone, amplifying sounds that night. So this sounded more like this to the birds. Birds get spooked. Birds fly into the dark. Birds wind up like this. So what about all the dead fish only 120 miles away? 
Thousands of dead fish wash up. Experts estimate somewhere between 80 and 100,000 fish died. And those experts look for a logical explanation. After poisoning is ruled out, and since there was no extreme weather that day to upset the ecosystem, suspicion falls on a nearby dam. Shortly before the mass deaths, 10 floodgates were opened. The rush of water forced excess amounts of atmospheric oxygen and nitrogen into the river. The result? Gas bubble trauma. In other words, the fish got too much air. And when that happens, so does this. Not good, but not quite the end of the world. April 2005, Hamburg, Germany. Mating season for much of the region's plentiful wildlife. But one species is getting a little less plentiful. Bizarre reports emerge of toads spontaneously exploding. Health officials get more concerned when a thousand toad corpses are found in one pond. Many people are concerned because it is widely known that this surface water would sooner or later be our drinking water. Did the amphibians chow down on some sort of bacteria that caused them to uber bloat? Researchers examine the water and come up empty. The public is warned to stay away from Pond Zero, just in case. The sooner they get a logical answer, the sooner everyone can calm down. Because according to Smolnik, the problem seems to be spreading. I heard about similar phenomena in Denmark, Holland, Mexico, and New Zealand. So, what kind of strange phenomena can cause animals to detonate and frag the area with organic shrapnel? I had some of them on my knee, my trousers. One idea, massive radio waves. After all, look what they can do to an egg. But no waves of that concentration were found near the pond. Veterinarian Frank Muchman makes a curious observation. There was a clear hole in the body exactly where the liver is, and the liver was missing. The punctures appear to be the work of a predator. But what? Crows are known as predators of amphibians. Crows performing a liverectomy after a toad explodes? Probably no big deal. But Dr. Moochman suggests the operation occurred while the creature was still living. So what kind of animal lets a bird remove its liver while it's still alive? The answer? One that's really preoccupied. The male is sitting on the back of his partner and is being carried by her over long distances to the pond where they breed. Moochman says that in the height of sexual excitement, 
the toads actually ignore their livers being dug out. Don't ask how he knows. Then what does a missing liver have to do with bloated, exploding toads? This is a common toad, and here you can see the lungs that can occupy a large space. With the liver missing, the lungs have room to hyperinflate. The lungs will take up this space as well and fill the whole body, so it looks like a balloon. And you know what eventually happens to overinflated balloons. Mystery solved. Culprit identified. The Grain Belt, Australia, 2011. After years of drought, farmers finally have a good harvest. But with it comes a big problem. Hey, folks, this is symbolic. If it is symbolic, it isn't the first time it's happened. In a similar plague during World War I, farmers killed millions of mice, while millions more ran amok. And in 1993, there was this. Hordes and hordes of mice appeared, eating their way through field after field. And when they finished eating the crops in the fields, they attacked barns and bins. As farmer Ann Venning remembers. These mice just poured out. I thought, when is this going to end, you know? But they just kept pouring out. I'm thinking, well, this is, you only see this in the movies. Oh, they're in my food. They were even going after farm animals, eating them alive. The pigs were just going berserk. The mice were all over them, chewing away. And the pigs just took it all. I had a hole the size of my thumbnail eaten out of my leg. Pretty soon, they were showing up everywhere. And as long as they were eating, they were breeding at stunning rates. A female mouse can have up to 10 litters a year, nearly one a month. But why is Australia hit by these plagues? I guess the reason why we have mouse plagues in Australia compared to other areas like Europe or America or some other place is that house mice in Australia are introduced. Brought from Europe on ships hundreds of years ago. Problem is, once the mice got here, they had it easy. It's an environment where there are a few native competitors for, for mice. So there's, there's not much competition for food resources or for shelter or anything like that. Now, consider the conditions during the years of the plagues. Plentiful rainfall, yielding abundant harvests, translated into massive amounts of food for mice. That's why 1993 looked like the end of the world. The solution? Strychnine laced grain. We were actually collecting 30,000 mice a day. 2011 marked the end of a long drought. Australia has a severe drought somewhere in the country on the average of once every 18 years, which triggers a logical cycle that winds up looking like the end of days. But if history is any indicator, this play, like the ones that came before, 
will end badly for man and mouse. July 2005, Geva's Turkey. A herd of 1,500 sheep are having breakfast when suddenly they all make a move and they head straight for a rocky, deadly cliff. 450 sheep are dead, which really upset the shepherd. But the bodies of the dead sheep cushion the fall for the remaining thousand or so that survived. So what happened? The answer lies somewhere here. Mara River, Kenya. Over a million wildebeest are on their annual thousand mile migration. It's a journey that's fairly routine. You can see highways through the grass where one army after another is coming along and going more or less to the same spot. But today, locals discover the unthinkable. As many as 10,000 lie dead in the water. They were drowned, and nobody could figure out why. What could have gone wrong? When they're coming to a river crossing, they're certainly going to look for e easier places to cross. Sure, you can expect some to be lost in the cycle of life. But why did this happen? Park officials notice a path cut through the thicket and realize that something may have diverted them from their usual route. But what kind of obstacle could possibly shift the wildebeest away from their normal crossing? The eco-tourist, maybe? After all, these banks have seen as many as 150 vehicles at one wildebeest crossing site. So, if you've got this in your way, you might wind up in a place downriver that's not so safe. Now imagine that the herd is all crowded together at the edge of the river. Who wants to be the first one to take the plunge? And Willoughby says, OK, you go. No, no, you go. No, you go. I'm not going to go. And so you get a, a bigger and bigger buildup until finally some poor fool plunges in. Once it starts, then it has a momentum of its own. One makes a bad decision. They all make a bad decision. It's a blind, blind following. And there are some that will turn around and try to come back. But there are others still coming. You can't make it. Before you know it, the herd pushes forward like a wild mob. And we all know how those things go. It looks like this. And this. The same herd mentality takes over. And you wind up with a pile of dead sheep. Two thousand four, Queen Elizabeth National Park, Uganda. A perfect place to watch herds of hippos bathing and grazing in their natural habitat. But lately, they're turning up dead. Why the consistency in mortalities and why these numbers? It felt like a mystery. With few clues, park officials become more than a little concerned. So many hippos dying, and the whole population was getting agitated, wondering what was happening. Guys with gloves show up to dig for answers. They suspect poachers. It's a common belief that if a woman eats the meat of a hippo, she will become fertile. But no one is eating these animals. 
and poachers would have taken the teeth. Epidemiologist Dr. Risto Heinenen makes a startling observation. He suspects a mysterious sickness is killing the hippos. These are criteria which uh, fit very well uh, to anthrax. But what's the source? While tissue samples are sent to a lab in Germany, the deadly disease shows up in other species. And finding where the anthrax came from is now a race against time. The bacteria responsible for anthrax lives in the soil all over Uganda. We know that hippos grow so close to the ground, and during dry season, they even tend to take in a lot of soils. But anthrax contaminated areas are usually small and few in number. You have to be unlucky as an animal to get infected by browsing in the wrong area. So that then caused perhaps four or five deaths, but not these big numbers like here. Then, Dr. Leanderts notices something bizarre. A group of hippos very interested in hippo carcasses. I got the suspicion that there may be some other profit from them being around the hippos, like eating the intestines, which are expelled through the anus due to the pressure in the body. We have never seen a hippo eating meat. As disgusting as it sounds, it makes sense. Say you're a hippo. There's a lack of food on land. Then, all of a sudden, out pops a sausage filled with undigested grass. The small intestines don't look like a steak, but still, it's, it's meat, you know? Because they were still filled with pre-digested grass, and that's like a, yeah, like a burger, and perfect, easy to eat, good for your health. Except when the intestine you just ate belonged to a hippo who ate anthrax spores. Now he's got it. He dies, and someone eats him. By August 2005, there were 360 dead hippos. But here's the good news. Eventually, it all came to an end. The rainy season arrived, and there was more grass. and no need to eat intestines. In effect, nature solved the problem. If I had anthrax and you would like to get it from me. This was a story that uh, had a lot of human emotion. I wanted to get back to the science uh, and I knew there would be some logic in, in, uh, for the explanation. And the logical thing to do is find out what kind of earthly reason a dog would have to jump off a bridge. If the dogs weren't chasing ghosts, then what? In this kind of habitat, we'd expect to find a wide range of mammals, um, ranging in body size from things like uh, mink. We'd find otters, roe deer. Foxes would be another mammal which would be quite common in an area like this. But it was the mink that interested animal behaviorists the most, and for very good reason. I knew that minks had very powerful anal sacs for marking, and uh, if that kind of scent was there, a working dog uh, would see that as a giant lollipop, you know, something, something to follow. So Dr. Sands collected the odors of three different animals and unleashed ten dogs. We found out that the bulk of the dogs headed almost directly towards the minks, and if that kind of scent was around the bridge, it could have an important influence on the dog's behavior for wanting to explore over the bridge and go beyond uh, the normal path. It all started to make sense. Newspapers report that so-called dog suicides were first noticed in the 1920s, right around the time the mink were introduced to this town. 
Now, consider the bridge. One of the first things that I did when I came to the bridge was get myself down onto the dog's level. What I found was the world uh, was blocked out by the stone. So now we're on to something. Maybe the dogs smell the mink, but can't see where it is. They have no concept of how high up they are. And they react instinctively to the scent and go over before they realize what hit them. But just in case there are evil spirits in the middle of the bridge, there's an easy fix. Stay away from the sides and keep your dog on a leash. Lake Tawakani State Park, Texas. 376 acres of forest, lakeshore, and granola eating visitors. Park rangers are mowing a hiking path when they stumble upon a staggering sight. And when I got back in there on this north point is when I came across this huge whale. It looked like something you might see in a science fiction movie. Really, it did. From the ground, the bushes, complete whole trees, and interior of the trees was even webs. A giant spider web, about a football field long, and four stories high. An apocalyptic plague in the making? Or is there another explanation? When I first saw the web, I was amazed because it was like a fairyland. A fairyland constructed by something a little more common. The second thought that came to my mind was that it looks like the worst B-movie set I've ever seen with ridiculous heavy cobwebs that couldn't possibly exist in nature and that it was real. I just couldn't believe it. And then I thought, I got to get my camera. <laughs> I'm not that really scared of spiders. I don't want them on me. But I knew there had to be a lot of spiders or a few real large ones. <laughs> Were giant spiders taking over Texas? There have been incidents in other parts of the world. During a recent invasion in India, people were even claiming to be seriously harmed. It bit me, and the wound has gone black and is bleeding. So what kind of spider was weaving its wide-ranging web inside Tawakani State Park? Turns out, not just one spider, but a lot of spiders. Experts are called in. We started receiving 25 to 50 emails a day from experts saying what they thought it was and no one had come to see it. And I thought, you know, we needed somebody there on hand to see what was going on and, see, and define what it really was. I mean, I'd seen aggregations of spiders with nothing like this. This was amazing. Probably upwards of 50,000 to 100,000. Spider samples are sent to a local university for identification. This is the spider that was most abundant in the webbing and caused much of the webbing. It is Tetragnatha guatemalensis. Just what we thought. But most spiders don't live in groups. That's why you usually see one at a time. Most spiders are cannibalistic. And if they're too close to one another, uh, they will f uh, feed on one another. So what's up with these things? What made this many spiders begin living together? The answer lies a short distance away. And behind this tree row was a pond that was full, and midges just emerged by the millions. This aggregation most likely uh, came from the, um, the abundance of food, which are these midges. 
And then there's this. We had a tremendous amount of rain, a good month's worth of rain. And I think that's probably what helped spur the everything coming back to life and all of the insects that came out besides just the spider. Heavy rain spawned an overabundance of small flies. Just before sunset and around dawn, the wing beats of all the midges created this hum that was evident throughout the whole woods in this peninsula. And with an increase in midge supply, there was a big change in spider behavior. Such an abundance of food that the spiders didn't need to compete against each other as they normally do, and uh, they became semi-social. Thousands of spiders gathered to feed on the unusual abundance. But once the flies were in check, nature returned to its usual balance the spider population returned to normal. And the once imposing web became a fading memory. Morro Bay, California. The brown pelican is enjoying a comeback. It's no longer endangered. When this starts happening. Up and down California's coastline, hundreds of sick and dying pelicans have been discovered within the past month. All of the birds appear wobbly. For some reason, we don't know yet why, uh, they're disoriented and weak. People are finding them in unusual places. These birds are landing in the middle of the road. Some of them are getting hit by cars. They're coming in very thin and a bit disoriented. Not just thin, the animals are starving to death. So what's going on? I'm looking at apocalyptic events taking place around the globe as we're constantly being reminded that we're nearing a time of biblical proportion. Experts look for toxins. And when you look to the environment, you can't help but consider the California wildfires. And all this fire retardant that seeps its way into the water system. But while tests look for a man-made cause, researchers discover something chilling. See that? That's frostbite. But wait a minute. Temperatures in this part of California never even got close to freezing. But to climate experts, it all makes perfect sense. The brown pelican is a migratory bird, which begins its winter flight in Oregon. But with weather staying warmer in the Northwest longer, many birds delayed flying south. When they finally started migrating, they hit winter weather they usually avoided. They got cold, tired, and couldn't find their usual food. The lucky ones that reached the California coast wound up feeding on sea urchin, squid, and whatever they could find. And it turns out, whatever is not very good for these fragile birds. So for the starving pelicans people were seeing around town, it was too little, too harsh, and too late. Spring 2010. Biloxi, Mississippi. The Kemp's Ridley is the most endangered sea turtle in the world. Only about a thousand nesting females are left in the ocean. And a lot of them are showing up dead. By the hundreds. 
I'm sure this guy knows our next question. It was a mystery. We didn't know initially what was the cause of the deaths. It really was upsetting to see so many dead ones coming in. Hundreds of turtles don't just die of natural causes all at once. Could this have something to do with it? One of the worst oil spills in U.S. history. The oil spill happened on 20th of April, about 120 miles south of Biloxi. And sea animals were not only exposed to the spill itself, but also the soapy chemicals used to break up the slick. The oil dispersants are probably the biggest controversy in this entire episode. And what the dispersants do, as the name indicates, uh, they take a highly concentrated piece of oil and spread it out. And you felt that uh, uh, they could have inhaled some of this. They could have come directly into contact. And so uh, the dispersants themselves and the combination of the dispersant with the oil and the spread of the oil in such a large area is going to be something that is going to be looked at. You look for visible oil, whether it's a, it's a sheen on the body or the grayish, blackish looking tar material. The oil mixed with the dispersant forms a um, thick gel-like material that is light brown in color. There's just one problem with the oil spill explanation, the autopsy. I was very surprised because I expected to find some kind of sheen, something on them, and they were just coming up dead with no, no visible oil on them. So what happened? Could the endangered turtles have eaten some contaminated food? If there were fish that were exposed to oil and these animals ate those fish, uh, you would have gastrointestinal problems, you'd have ulcers, you would have bleeding. But that isn't the case either. Veterinarians dig further. Then, a break. We had one live one that came in. It had sand all in the esophagus, and it like it was having a hard time breathing, making me think that it probably was a forced submersion. Forced submersion? That means drowning. When the vets go back and look at the other sea turtles, they find sand in their lungs, too. Now the question is, what could be keeping turtles submerged underwater? Shrimp boats are trawling. They're stirring up a lot of things on the bottom. Uh, these turtles look at these fish and shrimp as food, and they follow where they're being congregated. Turtles get caught in the nets and can't get to the surface for air. But by law, the fishing nets are supposed to have escape holes called TEDs. Thought maybe some of the shrimpers, some of their gear was not correct. The Mississippi Marine Patrol checks the boats in the area and ends up even more puzzled. All the fishing gear we checked was all correct. All their gear was good. Nothing was, nothing was wrong with it. Now here's something else to complicate things. The Ridley species is a very unique turtle. None of them can live together. And if we were to put them in another one of these tubs, uh, they will kill each other. The fact that they were all coming to one area is a big mystery. So how do you explain so many turtles in the same area? When you draw the Mississippi coastline, it is something similar to a forest fire. All the animals that were in these areas started moving towards uh, the Mississippi waters, and they started overcrowding. And so did the fishing boats. What we were happening is turtles were going through the tent, going just like they were, and they'd come out, and they'd come out swimming. OK, good so far. But we had so many boats in a little area that the next boat may come by and pick up the turtle. 
shooting through his tid before the turtle had a chance, chance to get his stride back. In other words, they didn't have a chance to come up for air. And he may have been caught two or three times by, the, by different boats coming through and kind of beating him up and not giving him a chance to survive. For a species already in decline, a loss of this kind is dead whales. A rain of dead birds. Fish washed up by the millions. Sure, there's a logical explanation for most everything. But sometimes, the explanation is simply us.